Welcome to the Damascus Road Podcast. On the road to Damascus, Paul had a radical encounter with Jesus and his life was changed forever. That is what we hope and pray for here. Now, on to this week's episode. So, sometimes we might have some little disagreements that can become a lot bigger than you expect. Now, this happened one time early on, uh, well before Joe, but when Megan and I started hosting and leading the DR postgrad small group in an incident well remembered as the great serial debate, TM. Now, it started out simply enough. Someone new had joined us that week for the very first time, so Megan thought that we should have everyone go around and introduce themselves and then share like some fun fact. Uh, in this case, she decided to have everyone share their favorite cereal. She thought this would be fun and it would be uncontroversial. See, oh, already, Rebecca knows it is not. But I mean, but I mean, come on, everyone has an, uh, some opinion about cereal. Everybody, like, at least enjoys some cereal. Maybe you are pro marshmallow. Maybe you're anti fruity cereal. Maybe you're a rebel who boldly declares tricks aren't just for kids, they're for adults too. And I figured it'd be, she figured it'd be a good question for me. I evaluate every bowl that I see based on its potential as a cereal, cereal bowl. I dream one day of a family bonding experience where I take my kids, we all buy ourselves our own cereal, we get home, get a big bowl, and we just sit and watch movies and eat cereal. And I know Joe will be down for it because he already loves cereal. And in addition, as we saw, Bernardo has a 45-minute a uh, video where he ranks all the different cereals and he was like positioned at the table where he would have gone like last. Uh, and Megan thought we'd end on a high note. Bernardo would, we'd, Bernardo would open up, share about some of his cereal opinions and a good time would be had by all. Unfortunately, the great cereal debate uh, quickly devolved into chaos as we went around the table. Started out simply enough, people sharing their favorite cereals. Then we got to Lee and Lee shared that he loves Chex. Simple, but as Bernardo said, a bit bland. You need to add some sugar. But this prompted Josh, who wanted to bond with Lee. He's like, ah, oh, I also love Chex. You know, he wanted to share. And, and, but he suggested to Lee mixing it with some other cereals that he thinks makes it really delicious. Unfortunately, Josh did not realize Lee is a cereal purist for whom mixing cereal is a total heresy. And instead of bonding, Lee was deeply offended. But this then started to kind of open up the floodgates and disagreement and judgment of one another's cereals just per poured out every time. Oh, you like plain Cheerios, the blandest of all Cheerios? Or, I'm um, sure, yes, we can agree that Captain Crunch is one of our most cherished naval officers. But oops, all berries, Captain Crunch, you've gone too far. Stop the madness. But the harshest judgment came when Peyton shared that his favorite cereal was granola, which... a which elicited a quiet but serious that's not cereal from Bernardo, which I think is fair. I agree. Granola might be found in the cereal aisle, but it's like on the end of the cereal. And it's like in, and, it's, and it is a part of some cereals for sure. But who just pours plain granola into a bowl, adds milk, and then calls that cereal in like the same category as Lucky Charms? Whole debate then ensued over whether or not granola is a breakfast cereal or not. And that wasn't even the craziest part. Because meanwhile, while we're all debating uh, the taxonomy of cereal and granola, one person steps up, unprompted, not even his turn yet, and Jacob just boldly tells all of us that he likes to add the milk first before he pour, pours the cereal. Ooh, to that. <laughs> suddenly, suddenly, nothing united us faster. <laughs> cereal mixers and cereal purists, they came together. All Cheerios were chairs. The captain took command. The pro granola, the anti granola parties, they set aside their agendas. We all had to come together against a greater enemy, the milk firsters. We had to set aside our differences to yell at Jacob about how wrong he was. 
I mean, Megan thought that we could just like go around and we could share our favorite cereals without conflict. I mean, surely cereal, that was a simple topic that everyone had an opinion on, but like none that were held so tightly that we would fight about it, surely. Oh, but my wife was deeply unaware of the deep, deep convictions that all of us held over what we pour into our bowls in the morning. Now, we all hold different convictions. Convictions are our firmly held beliefs that they guide our actions and our choices. You know, some are shared, but many are not. You know, many serial convictions uh, were, were expressed that night. And as we can see, when we disagree with one another's convictions, uh, that can provide greater uh, conflict or even dis- divisions when we're not aligned. Now, this is because no matter what they are, we feel our convictions strongly. And while some of our convictions are not particularly serious, we still feel serious about them. For example, beyond serial, I've heard a number of convictions from people in our community here, in our church, and those people will remain nameless, but I, well, actually, I don't think those people are here. I I, I suspected that those people might react as I announced their uh, convictions, but they're not here, as a hint to who this is. One, lettuce, spinach, other leafy greens, those aren't vegetables. I don't know what they are, but according to this person, they're not vegetables. Two, oh no, this person is here. Two, the belief that fries are better when they're soggy. Ooh, yeah, gross. Three, uh, food, the food robots are evil. Honestly, I just think they're incompetent. And four, the, the conviction that it's pronounced Reese's Pieces. Not Reese's Pieces, because, you know, you have to make it rhyme. So silly convictions, but convictions nonetheless, but we also hold many very serious convictions that we feel deeply about faith, about God, about what is right or wrong, what is moral, what is the good life, what it means to live as a follower of Christ in our day and age. And if we can get upset about cereal and about Reese's Pieces, they can be quite controversial. And we've seen division and conflict over these convictions explode over the past several years in our In our world, in our country, in our churches, convictions over politics, the pandemic, life in our postmodern age. I mean, we have convictions about things like masks and vaccines, systemic racism, critical race theory, Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, protests. We have convictions about Trump and Biden, Republicans and Democrats, faith and politics, patriotism and nationalism, convictions about who should be convicted and who should be locked up. We hold convictions about LGBTQ issues, about sex and sexuality, gun ownership, Russia and Ukraine, Israel and Palestine, dot, dot, dot. I can keep going. But the hard thing about a lot of these convictions is that we probably believe, at least to some degree, that amongst Christians, we should at least be able to agree on stuff. As Christians, we should share the same convictions. We should be rooted in moral absolutes, sound theology, and the Bible. Yet, obviously, there's a tremendous amount of conflict among our convictions. I'm sure I named something amongst this list of controversial convictions that caused you to think, well, that doesn't really belong. It isn't controversial. People who disagree about it are just fill in the blank. Maybe you think those people, well, they're denying clear parts of Scripture. Or they're picking and choosing the parts of Scripture that they want to focus on. Or they're blind to the social realities around them or they've just really intertwined and mixed up their politics and faith, or they have a bad theology and they're allowing the world to have too much influence. Basically, the people on the other side of these issues whose convictions are different, well, they're heretics, or they're they're haters, or they're idolaters, or they're judgmental. They're unloving. But I promise you that whatever that thing is that you're convinced has one clear orthodox answer, there's somebody you know, maybe even someone here today, who is doing their best to faithfully follow Jesus, and they completely disagree with you. They may think the same about you. But how can this be, and how do we handle it? The reality is that life with Jesus involves life with one another. And even when we agree on Jesus, we still have a lot we disagree on when it comes to following Jesus. How do we deal with our disagreement, our our division, and our conflict is all a very important part of our life with Jesus and our life with one another. 
And as we have been doing throughout this section of our summer in 1 Corinthians, it requires that we move beyond the mere idea of following Jesus into the nitty gritty of life with Jesus and one another. Now, thankfully, in our passage this morning, Paul addresses conflicting convictions amongst the Christians in Corinth. And as we consider our own convictions, Paul's wisdom is good and relevant for us today. So we pick up in chapter 8. Remember how in chapter 7, uh, Paul finally started addressing the Corinthians' questions that they had sent to him? Well, they not only have questions about sex and relationships, but they also have questions about meat. Now, regarding your questions about food that has been offered to idols, Paul starts. Okay, pause. What is this about? Paul doesn't tell us. He doesn't tell us the question. All we know is there is some question about food offered to idols, and that can really spark the imagination. Like, what are we talking about? Like, is this food that somebody kind of like put, put out on an altar? Has it been like burned up as like a sacrifice? Like, what kind of meat is it? Like, they're not doing human sacrifices, right? I don't know. Was Rome about that? I don't. What do I, I don't really know about ancient Rome. But really, Paul's assuming that his audience knows what he's talking about because they do. They wrote to him. They are living it. He, they asked him the question. Paul doesn't need to explain to them their question any more than Joe needs me to explain to him how cereal and then milk goes into a bowl and then is eaten with a spoon. When he goes and he grabs his bowl and he grabs his spoon and he starts pointing to the cabinet, he starts pointing to the fridge. Like he knows the, he knows the deal. I don't need to explain it back to him. But again, we're reading other people's mail. So we need to learn about the cultural context that the Corinthians are already implicitly understanding. Now, thankfully, Bible scholar Gordon Fee, who wrote the book on how to read the Bible, or at least a book called How to Read the Bible, which is quite excellent, and I would recommend it. And he tells us what is going on. The eating of cultic meals was a regular part of worship in antiquity. This is not only true of the nations that surrounded Israel, but of Israel itself. In the Corinth of Paul's time, such meals were still the regular practice both at state festivals and private celebrations of various kinds. And there are three parts of these meals the preparation, the sacrifice proper, and the feast. The meat of the sacrifices apparently was divided into three portions. That burned before the God, that apportioned to the worshipers, and that placed on the table of the God, which was tended by cultic ministers, but also eaten by the worshipers. The significance of these meals has been much debated, but most likely they involved a combination of religious and social factors. The gods were thought to be present since the meals were held in their honor and sacrifices were made, Nonetheless, they were also intensely social occasions for the participants. Um, for the most part, the Gentiles who had become believers in Corinth had probably attended such meals all of their lives. This was the basic restaurant in antiquity, and every kind of occasion was celebrated in this fashion. Okay, so the issue, as Fee explains, has two parts. There's the religious part and the social part. Now, the religious part is whether or not this meat is spiritually problematic because it's been sacrificed to these false gods. Would it be idolatry for a Christian to eat it? Would it disobey God? Would it impact a Christian spiritually? And the social part of this is that meat was commonly shared and eaten at festivals and social gatherings. So to avoid eating it would involve disconnecting from their old community. It'd be disconnecting from non-Christians entirely. Now, we've talked in the last few weeks about how corrupting sin can be, and many of our old patterns and habits must change when we start to follow Christ. But like also Christ himself dined with all sorts of peoples. He dined with religious leaders and prostitutes, Jews and Gentiles, tax collectors, um, all sorts of people. Jesus demonstrated how sharing a meal and a table with someone is a powerful tool for sharing the gospel, for sharing the love of God with others. So is it unloving then to avoid the non-Christians or is it unwise to continue engaging with them? If that, that's what they're trying to sort through. But there's also a third aspect regarding their own identity. Going back to the Old Testament, we can find many laws given to the Jews regarding their diet. Dietary laws were one of the most common and really visible ways in which devout Jews proclaimed their faith. They were deeply entrenched in important expressions of their identity as God's chosen people. For Jewish Christians, that is a hard thing to let go of. In Acts, it's a common and constant controversy. Even Peter, who's known for strong convictions and bold proclamations, even to the point of foolishness, flip-flops on them. 
I mean, at one point, he confidently leads the young church into, these, into new ways and dining with Gentiles in defiance of old Jewish laws, but later must be called out by Paul for caving to pressure from others when he stops eating and living in community with Gentile Christians. And so this is an important controversy rooted in belief, in culture, in, in practice, tradition, and identity for the church that's trying to sort through its own roots in, the, in Judaism. And it's addressed by the council of church leaders in Jerusalem. And Paul addresses it with the church in Rome as well. They have the same problem. And kind of all comes back to, well, if we don't obey God with what we eat in our lives, then who are we? Okay, so that's all what's at stake. I'm not sorry. There you go, it's a pun. Man, nobody got it. Okay, so what does Paul what does Paul say about this? Okay, we're going to jump ahead to verse 4, and he starts addressing this. What about eating meat that has been offered to idols? Now, we all know that an idol is not really a god, and there's only one god. There may be so-called gods both in heaven and on earth, and some people actually worship many gods and many lords. But for us, there is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created and for whom we live. And there is one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created and through whom we live. However. Not all believers know this. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real. So when they eat food that has been offered to idols, they think of it as the worship of real gods and their weak consciences are violated. It's true that we can't win God's approval by what we eat and we don't lose anything if we don't eat it and we don't gain anything if we do. So let's walk through Paul's argument. To start with, Paul agrees with one side. Paul agrees with the meat eaters. Since there's only one God, the gods that the meat is being sacrificed to aren't real. So the sacrifices aren't real. There's no power behind the sacrifices, so the meat is fine to eat. He is not saying that both sides have merit and hold equal weight. That's not what the issue is. Likewise, for that like list of controversial convictions uh, I listed earlier, I'm not claiming that every side in every example has equal merit. Whatever contentious issue jumped out at you, whatever issue you've been suing on, just waiting to tell me afterwards how wrong I was to suggest that this topic could possibly not have a clear right answer, well, I'm not here to say that there is not a right biblical, ethical Christian response. Just saying that um, it's complicated. And Paul agrees, in this case, with the pro-meat party. And he even seems to say that the believers who have like the stronger convictions against eating the meat are actually the ones who are weaker in their faith in this regard, which I'm not sure we would always think of if we consider our modern convictions, that the, the stronger convictions are actually uh, coming from a place of weaker faith. But Paul writes, with, writes regarding the powerlessness of this meat that not all believers know this. They know that it has no power because Paul knows that change is hard. And maybe they understand these gods aren't real, but they're still working through old practices, beliefs, and superstitions. And, and the others, the meat eaters, are more confident in their faith. They have, they have firm knowledge that this meat and these gods are nothing, and this meat is fine to eat. And the result of this is this difference of convictions. But obviously then, if Paul thinks the meat is fine and agrees with the meat eaters, then Paul would tell the Corinthians that, yeah, everyone just needs to come to the same, conclu came, same conclusion, all change their convictions and just go ahead and eat this meat, right? Well, no, that's not what Paul writes. Instead, he writes, you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. This is talking to the meat eaters, and he's telling them to be careful. He corrects the side that he seemingly has agreed with, not the ones who are wrong, but the ones who seem to understand and have knowledge. So what is going on here? Well, let's also look at what Paul writes to the church in Rome when he is addressing a similar problem that they're dealing with. Accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will only eat vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge what, whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. Now, interestingly, when dealing with these differing convictions, Paul does not say 
to correct people, to argue with them, to picket and protest, but instead he introduces this idea that there are gray matters. There are matters where Christians can faithfully and honestly form different convictions. These are separate from moral absolutes or core doctrines, which Paul is constantly uh, reinforcing uh, both as foundational to Christian faith. But instead, there are matters where Christians can legitimately disagree regarding what is right or wrong. They're not black or white, but gray. And in dealing with gray matters, it seems like Paul is encouraging us not to force our convictions on one another and avoid judging or condemning one another over them. But these things matter, right? If we believe others are wrong, aren't we allowing them to potentially walk into sin and experience the hurt or pain if we don't do something? So to ultimately understand Paul's guidance for engaging with one another over gray matters, we need to kind of step back and make sure we understand them. Because gray matters, like in this case of eating idle meat for the Corinthians or any number of the different kind of issues we wrestle with today, they're difficult. They're complicated. Tim Yulhoff and Richard Langer are professors of communication and theology, and they write this about uh, gray matters. Make no mistake, these truly are contentious matters, either because brothers and sisters in Christ will judge right and wrong differently, or because one Christian views the issue as a matter of right and wrong, and the other views this issue as like a mere difference. So even the categories can be disputed. Such issues are dis disputable or gray matters. We can even disagree about what is gray and what is black and white. In their book, Winsome Conviction, Mulehoff and Langer unpack Paul's teaching and help us to learn to engage with gray matters and conflicting convictions winsomely. And to do this, they define a conviction spectrum, which can help us understand what might be a gray matter and how things fall. It is a spectrum because, as they write, convic convictions are like light. They come in many colors, and they form across the spectrum. At one end of the spectrum is a confessional belief. This is an absolute that all Christians should share in common and define the boundaries of Christianity. It's something like, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, true God of one being with the Father, who came down from heaven for, our, for us and for our salvation by the power of the Holy Spirit, born from the Virgin Mary, was made man. Crucified, died, and buried, he rose again on the third day. Sounds familiar. I kind of adapted that, pulled that from the Nicene Creed where we state our confessional beliefs that unite us as Christians. And these are not up for debate between Christians. If you don't believe this, then you're not a Christian. Um, and in the case for the Corinthians, they, are, they share a confessional be belief that they all would agree on, that God alone is God, and God alone is worthy of our praise and worship. Now next on this spectrum is a moral mandate. Kind of the first step in moving our confessional beliefs into action, and again, are still universal or near universal amongst Christians, and is derived from the commands of Scripture. For example, love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. It's straight from Jesus, straight from the Old Testament. There should be little disagreement over this uh, moral mandate to love God and love others. And apply it again as we look kind of the Corinthians problem. We see they, they still kind of share this moral mandate. Do not make an idol or worship any other god. And now they're just starting to get into some disagreement, though, because for one side, to eat the meat is to engage in idol worship. But for others, to not eat the meat is to give power to these false gods that don't exist, but gives them power by in, in, do, in resisting this. Different convictions, but again, kind of coming from this same moral mandate. Uh, now, moving along the spectrum, we can come to core values. This is what we think is most important, our desired ends that guide us in our choices and help us to evaluate ideas, people, and events. Our confessional belief and our moral mandate um, shape our core values the, within our souls. Now, we actually often agree, I think, on the values themselves, but we will start to find disagreement in how we prioritize values. For example, I don't imagine many would say that, like, Caring for the poor is bad. We shouldn't care for people um, who are poor. But we also might not disagree with this idea that, you know, a country should be a good steward of our resources and taxes. Um, but then we might disagree on how those values play out and what matters most and how we um, actually execute on those. Our values are also where this uh, starts to get more heated. 
and more emotional in these conflicts. Because we ascend to belief, we obey commands, but we feel our values. In Corinth, the meat eaters value the freedom that they have in Christ. Christ died for us. He disproved these false gods. He demonstrated their powerlessness. We should not deny the freedom that God has given us from these false gods. On the other side is a deep value for fidelity and faithfulness. Freedom from sin and evil powers does not equate freedom to do whatever we want. And we should do our best to remain faithful to God among cultural forces that tempt us to turn from God. It's a value conflict over freedom versus fidelity. And then finally on the spectrum, we come to guidelines for conduct. Now, how do we actually act upon our values? How do we feel convicted to act? Our beliefs, our morals, and our values are expressed in the decisions we make, the actions we take, how we respond to questions of right, wrong, and gray matters. For the Corinthians, we can see two different convictions expressed. One, do not eat the meat sacrificed to idols and expose yourself to their power. And two, don't restrict your freedom based on superstition, but be faithful that God is where true power lies. Now, what is important to understand from the spectrum is to understand where our convictions lie and how they tie into our core values and our beliefs about who God is and who God says we are. Now, oftentimes when another Christian disagrees with our convictions, we feel as if they're disagreeing with core foundational doctrines. We wonder, are they even Christian? Are they reading the same Bible? And in some cases, maybe there's issues with uh, their doctrine, issues with kind of what people are believing and building on. Um, but the disagreement may also just be coming from far down the line of this spectrum. And in this example from Corinth, uh, yeah, we can see that there still can be the same core confessional belief that God alone is God and whatever our praise and worship. They can share the same moral mandate in response to that, about this belief to not make an idol, to not worship any other God. And this, you can have the same foundation, the same unifying uh, foundation as Christians, and then come to different conclusions about how we should act and respond. Now, this does not mean the issues don't matter, but it should influence and shape how we respond. And with this in mind, we turn back to Paul's guidance. You must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. For if others see you with your superior knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, won't they be encouraged to violate their conscience by eating food that has been offered to an idol? I think some of that, I'll stop there to highlight that. They will be encouraged to violate their conscience. I want to remember what you know, we learned from Caleb a few weeks ago. Sin is about doing right and wrong, but it's more than that. Sin is also about what takes us away from God. And if you believe that something is wrong, and you do it anyways, whether or not that's an absolute right or wrong, that pulls us from God. If you believe something is right and you don't do it, that pulls us away from God. And so Paul says, if you, you know, eating meat may not be bad, but if you encourage, but if it encourages someone to violate their conscience by eating food that has been offered to an idol, he warns us against that. So because of your superior knowledge, a weak believer for whom Christ died will be destroyed. And when you sin against other believers by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you're sinning against Christ. So if what I eat causes another believer to sin, I will never eat meat again as long as I live, for I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. Paul might agree with one side of the argument, but that doesn't change that these are difficult topics to sort through. And often we're operating in areas of competing values rather than core doctrine. And instead, pay attention to where Paul places greater responsibility. It's on those who know better. For our purposes this morning, feel free with all of your convictions to assume that you're on the side that knows better. It's because Paul tells you, us to lay that down, to not necessarily act on that as we might think we should. Because what does Paul say to those who know better? He says to lay down your freedom and not cause one another to stumble. Ultimately, uh, to take from that, our priority is never to establish rightness. Our priority is building each other up in faith, being willing to lay down any of our privileges for the sake of others. For Paul, the greatest value, our greatest values should be unity in the church as we love and build one another 
When we recognize that we are getting to issues of competing values or guidelines for conduct along this conviction spectrum, um, we can instead, uh, when we recognize that that's where we're getting into conflict, it's easier to hold our convictions with more grace for one another and to find common ground instead to build upon. We can find agreement in, in our beliefs and seek to understand one another's values. Those values may not be that different from ours. They just may be ordered differently or executed differently. Now, they're not wrong. The other people may not be wrong or ignorant, but are just simply trying to sort through a different, a complicated issue in coming to a different conclusion than us. And ultimately, in gray matters, Paul promises us that we'll all answer to God. In Romans, Paul assures us that, yeah, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let us stop condemning each other. It's not our job. God will take care of that. But decide instead to live in a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. We will all answer to God. Judgment, condemnation, that is God's job. God will take care of it. God will stand for what is right. Um, that is not our job. Instead, we are encouraged by Paul to faith, live faithfully to our convictions while seeking to avoid judging the strong in faith and offending the weak in faith. Our duty is to each other while we trust God to sort it out in the end. And throughout the next chapter of 1 Corinthians, uh, chapter 9, which is something we're going to explore later in the summer, Paul gives his own personal example of how he lays down all of his rights and freedoms out of love for their sake. And Paul, but Paul continues addressing this uh, topic, this question in chapter 10. And one of the things he does is he reminds the Corinthians as well, something we should remember, don't put too much trust in your knowledge anyways. So remember, Megan, at the beginning of the summer, described the Corinthians as like the puffed up ones because they're really big in head knowledge, but limited in love and the practical reality of following God. So even in our confidence and our knowledge, we should remember um, to not put too much trust in it. Paul reminds them, gives the example of, in chapter 10, of the Israelites, because the Israelites had the greatest knowledge of God of anyone. The Israelites saw God's awesome power firsthand as they were literally guided by God in a cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night from Egypt, the land of their slavery, to Israel, the land promised to them by God. So if anyone had the greatest knowledge of God, it's them. And Paul writes, all of them ate the same spiritual water, uh, spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water. So it's not even an issue of diet like it was for the Corinthians. Yet they still fell to idolatry as well. God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were not scattered in the wilderness. These things happened as a warning to us so that we would not crave evil things as they did or worship idols as some of, us, some of them did. As the scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. And we must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. We are human, and we are prone to overestimate our own knowledge. Paul reminds us that if the Israelite, Israelites could, fall, could fail and turn to idolatry, I, who has never been led by God as a pillar of fire, as far as I know, I might also fail. Because knowledge does not save us. Knowledge does not protect us from turning from God isn't to say we don't need knowledge, but there's something we need even more. In fact, Paul really, he gave away the answer right at the beginning of this section, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Yes, we know that we all have knowledge about this issue, but while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much, but the, but the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. Love trumps knowledge. When choosing between flaunting our knowledge, choose love. Rather than argue our rightness, choose love. Does this mean we never correct one another? That we never risk conflict or disagreement over important issues with one another? No, but it means that, we engage with these gray, that when we engage with these gray matters, we do it from love first most. We do it because we care for others. We love others and we want to watch them grow. This is what Paul teaches the Corinthians to do. Let love guide them. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. So you may eat any meat that is sold in the marketplace without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If someone who isn't a believer asks you home for dinner, accept the invitation if you want to. 
Eat whatever is offered to you without raising questions of conscience. But suppose someone tells you, well, that meat was offered to an idol. Then don't eat it out of consideration for the conscience of the one who told you. It might not be a matter of conscious conscience for you, but it is for the other person. Why should my, but then, why should my freedom be limited by what someone else thinks? If I can thank God for food and enjoy it, why should I be condemned for eating it? But whatever, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So a complicated, Paul keeps making arguments for either side and either response in that, but that last line kind of gives us our guiding principle. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Will eating this food cause someone else to stumble? Then don't eat it. Will rejecting this food create an unnecessary barrier for someone who doesn't know Jesus? Eat it. Whatever we do, do it for the glory of God. Choose love first. Now, sometimes this means laying down our preferences, like the meat eaters in Corinth, to honor the strong convictions of those who had a weaker faith, as Paul describes them in chapter 8. And other times it means lovingly engaging with difficult topics with the goal of moving closer to Christ together. But to do all of this well, we do need to sort through our own convictions and values to know how to love others well in our own gray matters. Paul encourages us to be fully convinced in our own mind. Our convictions, which express our values and guide us how we live, are these practical expressions of our faith in the world. And in order to engage lovingly with others in their convictions, we need to develop an understanding of our own personal convictions. And they are personal because they are formed by each individual and not a general command for the entire church. And they're convictions because they're more than preferences. They are formed by careful reflection on what we believe Jesus teaches. Milhoff and Langer present a process for unpacking our convictions that they call conviction mapping. And they write about it, that conviction mapping helps us to examine and understand our convictions. And it helps us to see how they are connected to our own life experiences and to our own social context and the groups of which we are part. Conviction mapping also helps us make us more aware of how our convictions emerge from our theological and confessional beliefs. In other words, this process thickens our convictions, helps us to understand how deeply our convictions are woven into the fabric of our souls. And conviction mapping moves us through four stages. First is clarifying your convictions. Consider your convictions. What do you feel strongly about? What is right and wrong? And narrow that down. Get specific. What is the guideline for conduct that your conviction leads you to believe? You know, like, for example, in the passage today, this means moving from this belief that, well, we should not worship false idols and narrowing that down to this personal conviction that maybe it's like we should not eat the meat sacrificed to idols. Second is identifying the social context, understanding the person and understanding the personal history of your convictions, because we are shaped by our context, by our environments, by our families, by our experiences in our community. A lot of our convictions come from those around us and informs them. So ask yourself, when did you start to feel this way? What are some of the, what are the defining events, relationships, or life experiences that crystallize your thinking about this issue? Or what emotions surface when you think about it? Be specific and describe your powerful feelings. Are you just mad or are you offended? Do you feel neglected or condemned? And third is narrating your convictions. Don't just reduce it to a rule, a reason, or a single Bible verse, but tell the story of why you believe what you believe. A helpful way to start narrating a conviction is something is to say something like, start, some, start off with something like, well, let me tell you what I think about blank and why I think that I think it. Or simply, well, here's what I think I think and why. Yes, that's very awkward phrasing, but it does convey some of the honest uncertainty that lies in understanding our own hearts. And it helps us to move into more of a storytelling mode instead of just a teaching mode. Because in teaching mode, we're just trying to pass along propositional content instead of telling stories and experiences. And that also can tend to be more of a one-way conveying of information and arguments rather than an invitation to conversation together. And finally is tracing that conviction spectrum. Remember, we start with our confessional belief, an absolute that all Christians share in common and define the boundaries of, our, of Christianity. And that moves then to a moral mandate, the universal or near universal um, mandates among Christians that comes from commands from Scripture. And next are core values. Your core values are what start to make your beliefs and morals actionable. It's what you think is most important. Your desired ends that guide you in your choices and help you to evaluate ideas, people, and events. And last is guidelines for conduct. 
How do you actually act upon your values? Now, don't worry if you um, aren't getting all this because that is, uh, we're gonna, we have a handout and we're gonna do this practice together. And one thing you can do as a part of it, if you are struggling with kind of understanding all of this too, and you're the, as you can use a ladder of integrity, the tool that we learned in the Emotional Healthy Relationships course this spring, that kind of can help you work through this and sort through what are your values and how you're wearing to act out on those values. So, encourage you uh, during, today during our, our practice time to think about a conviction or two and work through this process and use one of the handouts um, that are up here. And the goal though of going through this process is not to weaken or like reverse or change your convictions. I mean, sorting through your convictions like may do that. You may recognize this conviction does, really just comes from uh, the influence of a person, but is not very biblical. Um, or, you know, may just help you adjust it or change it. I mean, certainly it does seem like Paul's hope for the Corinthians is that some of their convictions may change along with the maturing of their faith. But this process may also have the effect of thickening your convictions. You know, reinforcing your convictions, deepening them beyond what we feel is right or wrong to an understanding of those principles and beliefs that go beneath them. And in the end, your convictions are deeper, stronger, and more rooted in God. And it is good to engage with mapping convictions in order to help out with acting out on our convictions. Because when we do the work to understand our convictions, we can begin to understand the convictions of others. We can respond with love when our convictions don't align, motivated not by being right, but by seeking to move closer to Jesus together. And we can walk alongside one another, not just stand between them and God. A few years ago, I felt convicted. It wasn't over cereal, but it was with my dad. He'd made a decision that I disagreed with, um, but we had competing values that were guiding us. It was a gray matter. And we're both Christians. We share our, belief, our, our beliefs and many of our core values, but we just didn't agree on whether the Bible tells us that one is right and the other is wrong. And I had to, I had to decide how I was going to respond. Now, I knew I didn't want to just like start an argument. That wouldn't really change anything. Arguments and debates rarely do. So instead, I sat in my conviction with God. I examined what was bothering me. I did a ladder of integrity, and I dug into what my values really were. And I decided that I needed to speak up because I love my dad, but was concerned for his own faith and flourishing. And to his credit, my dad let me do it. He loved me in return, not by changing his mind and agreeing with me, but by giving me a real chance to share my concerns and allow me to challenge him. I love my dad, and I wanted him to know that I cared about what was best for him, just as he has always cared about what is best for me. I chose love, and so did he. And it is love that strengthens us. When we all choose love, and whatever we do, do it for the glory of God. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you um, for this space to gather and worship. Thank you for your wisdom and teachings from Paul that still carry so much weight and wisdom for us today. Help us to sort through, um, through the challenges we have, the con conflicts we have with one another. Understand that we are rooted in faith in you, Lord, even if we come to disagreement on how that practically means we live in the world today. Help us to love each other in that and not judge and condemn, Lord, but instead act faithfully um, on your guidance in our lives. May we choose love for one another, the Lord. May we choose to glorify you over ourselves. In your holy name I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining the Damascus Road podcast. Our mission is to follow Jesus together by being with God, loving everyone, transforming people, developing leaders, growing new ministries, and changing the world. You can find out more about us online at DamascusRoadTucson.com.